I am providing this PowerPoint to give you some background on membrane transportation uh, and the membrane itself with some terms that you should know throughout this lab. Uh, a lot of these things you will be learning in lecture, but if you haven't hit this lecture yet, uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up on, on these details. We've learned about the plasma membrane uh, in our last lab when talking about the cells and the organelles that are in eukaryotic cells. So the plasma membrane is basically this phospholipid boundary uh, around the cell. It is a structure found in all cells, both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Um, the, what we see here, this picture below, uh, is just showing the phospholipids, not the proteins that are also found in the plasma membrane. But basically, it is made up of two layers of phospholipids. The heads of these phospholipids are going to be hydrophilic. They are going to be water-loving. This is a picture up here showing a single phospholipid. The head is uh, hydrophilic. The tail is hydrophobic, which is water-fearing. And so they line up together like this with the heads on both the outside of the membrane and the inside of the membrane, because this is where we'll be finding water. Water will be outside of the cell and inside of the cell. This layer right here is where the tails come together of the two layers of phospholipids. Uh, these tails are hydrophobic, so they are in an area where there is not water. And so um, they come together uh, and kind of separate uh, separate the water from to the outside and the inside, or I should say the inside and the outside of the cell. So we're going to be talking about membrane transport, uh, how things move through the membrane. Uh, so we have this cell membrane or the membrane that is around an organelle. Lots of things have to go through this membrane. Um, food. Uh, so the cell needs to bring food inside. The cell needs to bring in oxygen. Uh, the cell needs to dispense waste. Um, so we eat our food, we then put out waste. Cells are doing the same thing. Uh, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. That is because cells are bringing in oxygen and out CO2. Um, there are lots of other things uh, that are being uh, brought in and out. Um, uh, ions, um, proteins that are being made by the cell and then sent out. Uh, they could be hormones. Uh, cells in our body make hormones and different steroids, and then they send those molecules out to the rest of the body. And so how these molecules are moving in and out of the cells themselves is what we're going to be talking about. This is membrane transport, how molecules are transported through the membrane. And there are two ways uh, that we'll be talking about. Uh, there are the passive processes and the active processes. So passive basically requires no energy. Uh, no ATP is needed for the passive processes. Um, substances will be moving up and down, uh, sorry, they will be moving down the concentration gradient. Uh, we'll see a picture later, and this is showing a natural phenomenon uh, of how molecules move in the universe. Uh, they move down the concentration, and cells are just able to harness this natural process. Uh, examples of this uh, passive, um, passive transport, uh, passive mem membrane transport, uh, simple diffusion, which we will be seeing a picture of, uh, osmosis, which we'll be working on today. Osmosis is basically the diffusion of water. And then facilitated diffusion, which we'll also be looking at a picture here. So diffusion and osmosis happen through the membrane. So we saw those, those phospholipid layers. 
molecules are able to slip through those phospholipid layers. Uh, small, particular small molecules are able to. Uh, and that is an example of simple diffusion. If it's water that is going through the membrane, um, that is also, uh, that is osmosis. Facilitated diffusion is when you have a protein in the membrane that is kind of like a tunnel through a mountain. Uh, it is providing this large opening that things can move through. Uh, so that is the facilitated portion. Diffusion, because molecules are still moving through the concentration gradient. They're moving down the concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. Um, so this doesn't use energy. It's just making a larger hole so molecules can move down the concentration gradient in a natural way. Active processes, which we will not be talking about a lot uh, in lab, um, but these require energy. And basically, this is if you're moving really large objects, uh, really large molecules, a, uh, you know, if a cell was going to eat another cell, um, or if you are going to move molecules against the gradient. And we'll talk about what a concentration gradient is. So diffusion. The movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. And this is this gradient that we were talking about. A high, moving from a high gradient to a low gradient. Or a high concentration to a low concentration is moving with the gradient. Is kind of flowing down the stream. Um, whereas going against the stream, uh, if you had to paddle up the stream, you would have to involve energy to paddle your way up the stream. You are going against the gradient, against the current of the stream. And so it's a, a good metaphor. Uh, molecules will move along this concentration gradient from high to low until they hit this equilibrium. Uh, I don't have a picture here, but think about putting a tea bag into water. Uh, you have no tea in this clear water, uh, and you have a lot of tea in the bag that you're putting into the water. As soon as you put that bag in the water, you see that the molecules of the tea are starting to leave the bag and go into the water. That is this movement, this diffusion through the tea bag from high concentration to low concentration. Uh, and then if you let it sit there long enough, eventually it will hit an equilibrium and you'll have this same number of particles inside and outside of the bag. Now I get that, that the we have to be thinking about molecules that are able to fit through the actual tea bag, and there are large particles in there that are not able to fit through. Um, so those cannot be looked at when, when talking about equilibrium. It has to be things that are able to move in and outside of the bag, like a membrane. So here we have an example of what is happening with diffusion. So on this side, um, on the left-hand side, we have a before picture. So it is a glass uh, of water with a membrane down the middle. And on one side of this membrane, there is a high concentration of a particular particle. This could be salt, this could be sugar, this could be lots of different things. Let's say sugar. So on the left side of the membrane, there is a lot of particles of sugar. On the right side, there's only a few. Now, if this sugar was able to move through this membrane, and they're little tiny cracks, we just have to imagine that the sugar is able to move through. So over time, this high concentration of sugar, sugar will start to move to a low concentration. Uh, so these particles will be moving. So over time, you will have something like this. 
where the sugar has moved to the lower concentration and you will hit this equilibrium over a certain amount of time. Now there are, you know, particles are flowing back and forth, back and forth constantly, uh, so it's not just going to be no motion at all once it hits equilibrium, but the equilibrium will somewhat stay. Now sugar is not the only particle here. We also have water. So in this example, the sugar is in a high concentration on the left side, but the water is in a high concentration on the right side because all of the sugar is taking the place of where there could be water. So not only will sugar be moving from the high concentration to the low concentration, but water will be moving from the high concentration to the low concentration. So you will have this equilibrium, not only of the sugar, but the water as well. So there are certain, there are a couple factors that can affect the rate of diffusion. So when I say rate, I mean the speed of diffusion. The steepness of the concentration gradient. So the larger the difference between the sides, the faster the diffusion. And so when we look at this picture, um, this is showing uh, one side, the other side, and then this uh, membrane uh, in the middle. And so if you have a much greater concentration. Uh, so if the difference between concentrations is much different from one another, so very high, very low, then the speed of diffusion will be much faster than if they were close to equilibrium. Uh, if they were close to equilibrium, this would be just a little bit higher than this one, it's just a little bit lower, and the speed would be much slower. So that means uh, when you start off with a really high concentration and a really low concentration, it'll start off really fast, but then it'll start to slow down, and once it hits equilibrium, it'll be very slow. Temperature. Uh, the higher the temperature of your solutions, uh, the faster the diffusion. Temperature is basically this it's a number that tells you the amount of energy that is in your solution. And the more energy that's there, the faster molecules are moving, the faster they're moving, the faster they're able to go through the membrane, and they're faster to diffuse. Uh, molecule size. So the smaller the molecules, the faster they're able to, able to diffuse. So when we think of you know, if we had, if we were looking at a concert and we had a huge room full of people on the floor and I had a small child and a large adult and I told both of them that I wanted them to go through the crowd and get to the other side. That small child would be able to weave in and out of their of people's legs and squeeze through these small little holes to get to the other side much faster than a large adult. A large adult would be lumbering through slowly, kind of pushing people aside, uh, and it would take much longer. Well, molecules are in the same way. You know, they're in this large, large cluster of other molecules, and the larger the molecule you know, the, the longer it takes to kind of move through. So the smaller the molecules, the faster they are able to diffuse. And then we just, when we have um, nature itself, there are things like wind, water currents that are able to affect uh, diffusion, um, things that are happening naturally. But these are hard to predict, and so we, we don't really get into those. So what is able to diffuse through the phospholipids of a plasma membrane? Um, well, we've got, um, we've got a picture here showing the plasma membrane, uh, just a little cutout of the plasma membrane, the phospholipids. Uh, and then we've got <coughs> a membrane with a large protein. And this is this 
the idea of facilitated diffusion. So certain molecules are not able to go through the actual phospholipids. They have to go through this protein-made tunnel through the membrane. And so what can go, so simple diffusion are molecules that can go through the actual phospholipids. So what can go through? Molecules that are small. So large molecules will not be able to fit through the phospholipids. They have to be small molecules in order to, to go through uh, uh, simple diffusion. Uncharged. So there is no negative charge or positive charge, meaning ions cannot do this. Uh, polar molecules cannot do this. Now, water is its own situation. Water is polar, uh, and so it's kind of thought, um, don't be confused there. Uh, water is able to go through osmosis, which is simple diffusion, uh, but other large polar molecules are not. So nonpolar molecules can simple, simple diffuse. Um, but again, don't, get, don't, be, don't be confused because water can as well. Uh, examples, uh, O2, CO2, these are small molecules. They are uncharged and they're nonpolar. Uh, so what cannot uh, simple diffuse? Uh, so it has to go through facilitated diffusion. So what needs these proteins for facilitated diffusion? Larger molecules, charged, so ions in polar. Uh, examples, glucose, so it, sugar is this large molecule, and then we have these other two ions here. So the take-home message with this is this is showing you what simple diffusion is going through these, plasma, uh, these phospholipids themselves, uh, whereas uh, facilitated diffusion uh, is using this protein um, still natural, moving with the concentration, there's no energy involved. But there is a difference of what can go through. Osmosis is diffusion of water uh, in response to a gradient across a semi-permeable membrane. So the same thing when you have a high concentration of water and a low concentration of water. This is osmosis, the diffusion of water. Basically, osmosis is just simple diffusion of water. Tonicity, the concentration of all molecules dissolved in a solution. Uh, so I guess we should talk about solute and um, solvent. Um, so in most cases, when we're talking about biology, Solvent is water. Uh, it is what is going to be uh, is going to be kind of breaking down uh, these other molecules and kind of putting them in suspension. Uh, so solvent would be the water. Solute would be these other molecules that are in the water. Both the solute and solvent together will make the solution. So the hypertonic solution will be a solution with high solute and less water. So when we're talking about, and a lot of the times what we'll be talking about um, is in comparison to the cell. So the cell is this sack of water, basically. Uh, there is a certain concentration inside the cell of all of these different particles. So if we were talking about salt, uh, there's a certain concentration of salt in this cell. And so if you were to put this cell in a certain solution, how does it compare to the inside of the cell? And so when we're talking about these different tonicities, um, we're going to be, they'll be compared to the cell. And so, um, so a hypertonic solution is going to be one with more solute than inside the cell and less water. So more solute, so more particles, 
those particles are taking up space, which means there is less water. Hypotonic is a solution with less solute. When you have less particles, you will have more water. Isotonic is when both solutions are the same amount, have the same amount of solute and the same amount of water. So again, we'll be talking about these types of solutions uh, when you put a cell in them, or if the external environment of a cell is one of these types of solutions, what will happen? Remember, hyper. Um, one way I, one way I uh, think about this to help me, when you think about hyper, um, you know, when kids are hyper, they're, you know, they they're, have a lot of sugar in them. Uh, they have a lot of caffeine in them. They're hyper. So this caffeine, this sugar, is this solute. So high sugar, high, sol, uh, high solute um, is this hypertonic. Um, hypo is slow, so there's not a lot of sugar in this person. Uh, they're kind of slow and lethargic. Um, so hypo, low solute. I don't know if that'll help, but it always helps me. So when you put these cells into these particular solutions, what will happen? Well, water, like all molecules, wants to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So water wants to move from a hypotonic, where there is more water, where there is more water, uh, then it wants to move from a hypotonic to a hypertonic solution more water to less water because there is more solute less solute so water is going to move from hypotonic to hypertonic but let's say the other particle we're talking about is salt salt is going to move from a hypertonic to a hypotonic so water is flowing one way solutes would be flowing the other way now if this was an animal cell let's say these are blood cells uh, so um, we put these blood cells in these different solutions, what's going to happen to them? Well, if you put uh, the blood cells into a hypertonic solution, hypertonic has more solutes, less water. So if there is less water outside the cells, more water inside the cells, the water will flow outside it will go it will leave the cell because it's going from the high to low concentration um, and so your water will leave the cells will kind of shrivel up and this term is crenation when the cells kind of shrivel up isotonic the same amount of water is inside and outside uh, and so water's just flowing back and forth, back and forth. Everything's in equilibrium. And for an animal cell, that's perfect. That's what it wants. Uh, if you put cells in a hypotonic solution, so you are putting cells in, an, in a solution with more water, uh, higher concentration of water, uh, less concentration of solute. So if you put if you put red blood cells into pure water, um, then there is much more con or higher concentration of water outside than inside. Water is then going to be flowing from outside to the inside of the cell. It's flowing from high to low. And so the cells can only hold so much water. And like a balloon, they're going then to pop. So if you put these blood cells into pure water, eventually they're going to um, it's called cytolysis and that's when the cells burst because they've swollen up with so much water they can't hold it anymore and they pop plant cells are a little different because they have a cell wall so the effects of osmosis on plant cells as cell 
A cell expands uh, in a hypotonic environment. Fluid exerts a force against the plasma membrane and the cell wall, and that is called turgor pressure. So when we saw that you put an animal cell in pure water, uh, a hypotonic solution, it's going to pop. Well, plant cells won't pop because they have a cell wall that will keep that structure together and won't let it expand to that point. Turgor pressure. Um, well, I guess that's this over here. When you put a cell in hypotonic solution, the water is flowing from high concentration outside to the lower concentration inside, and it swells up, but you see the cell wall is keeping it from popping, and that's called turgid. Uh, the turgid, the turgor pressure is built up, and it's now turgid, which is very much what that cell wants. Um, as you can see, the vacuole is filled with water. Um, Isotonic solution, you know, you've got this kind of flowing inside the equilibrium here, the same amount flowing inside and outside. The cell is able to do its functions, but it doesn't have this turgor pressure. It doesn't, uh, it's not, it's not um, full, if you will, uh, with the pressure against the wall. It is flaccid. And so if you ever see a plant that's flaccid, it's kind of on the verge of looking wilty. And uh, it's, you know, it's able to do what it's needed to do, but it's not what it wants. Uh, if a plant cell is put into a hypertonic solution, so there is less water outside, more water, more higher concentration of water inside, the water is going to leave the cell. And so the cell will shrink uh, in a hypertonic solution. And this is called plasmolysis. Uh, it kind of shrivels up, and in this case, the plant would be very wilty looking. So hopefully these terms uh, will help you in your, in your lab. Uh, so keep these in mind. Um, you know, go through this whole hypertonic, hypotonic solution. Uh, you definitely need to know these terms, not only for this lab, but for lecture and for your practical and quiz.